Hi, I'm Sheena Bodkin. I'm a board-certified obesity medicine physician and a certified intuitive eating counselor. Today, I'm going to talk about why it's so easy to put weight on and why it's so difficult to lose it. Let's dive into my favorite slide. This slide shows the weight set point range. You can see across the top that there are weights given in the form of BMI, taking into consideration our weight and our height. And beneath that, you can see all of these ranges. These ranges you will notice are either narrow, medium. As you look towards the bottom, they're getting wider. And this is just representing all of us. We each have a weight set point range, and it can be very different from those around us. So how does the set point work? If we look at this slide in front of us, we can see that if you are dieting, it can take you outside of your set point range. And you can lose weight, and then when the diet ends, your body will fight back to get you back within your set point range. Remember, your body can maintain your weight so long as it's between your set point range goalposts. If you look at the other end, you can see that if your weight goes beyond your set point range and then you stop, your body will go back down to within your set point range. So how do diets cause our body to fight back? Well, one of the primary ways that they do is by causing a reduction in our metabolism. Diets cause the brain to think that there is a famine. And this includes all types of diets. So long as you are restricting your input, which really is the definition of a diet, your brain will respond by reducing your metabolism. We know this best from the Biggest Loser study. This study went from 2009 through to 2015, and it was studying the contestants of the Biggest Loser competition, which you may be familiar with. These contestants all lost weight, some more than others, but when they lost weight, they also found their metabolism reduced by a similar amount in proportion to how much weight they lost. When they followed up with these contestants six years later, most of them had their weight back on, but when they measured their metabolism, their metabolism was still reduced as if they had just finished the diet. This is a problem because it means that diets reduce our metabolism and this effect is persistent. So we know that this reduction in metabolism went on for six years, and that's when the study stopped. So we don't know what happened afterwards. So basically, any diet that takes you out of the low end of your set point range is going to cause a reduction in metabolism that is going to persist, meaning not only will you regain the weight, but now, if you go back to eating when, the way you would when you were not on a diet, you are at risk of ending up heavier than when you started. The second way that our body reacts to us dieting is by changing our hormones. Now, many people think that hormones are to do with insulin or thyroid when it comes to weight, but that's actually not most of the hormonal control. There are many hormones in our body that control our appetite, meaning our hunger, and our fullness. I'm going to read the top of this slide and then go to the box on the right. 14% weight loss produced changes in eight hormones that encourage weight regain. This was based on a 10-week lifestyle-based weight loss intervention in healthy, overweight, and obese adults. 
It led to sustained elevations in appetite-stimulating hormones and decreases in appetite-suppressing hormones. If you look at the title of this article, you'll see that it says long-term persistence of hormonal changes. So this is another study showing that the hormonal adjustment to going on a diet also continues after the diet is over. In fact, this study showed that your hunger levels were higher, your fullness levels were lower one year after the end of the diet. So here we are back at my favorite slide again, the weight set point range. So when you're looking at this and wondering where you may fall on this set point range, what do you think is the biggest predictor of your given set point range? Well, the answer is genetic susceptibility. In fact, genetics account for 70% of why we end up the size and shape that we do. We know this from Swedish twin studies where they had 93 pairs of identical twins who were raised apart and they brought them back and checked their weight and found that 70% of these twins raised in different households had statistically significant matches in their weight. So when you're thinking about genetics, it can be complicated. So that's why it's really important to think of genetic susceptibility or genetic likelihood. When you look at the range that's given below, you can see that at one end, there are people who are very resistant to gaining weight. And at the other, there are those who are very susceptible to gaining weight. We all have different susceptibilities, even in a given environment. So what about this given environment? Environmental factors do impact our weight. Uh, you can see here a graph, two graphs, in fact. One on the left is from 1970, and the one on the right is from 2013. And what this is showing is how uh, weight has become a greater problem over the years, and it is due to our environment. So I like to think that our genetics have not changed, they haven't, but what has changed over the years is our environment. So with a certain genetic susceptibility, our environment can make us much more susceptible to gaining more or less weight. When you look at the reasons, some might say, well, what is the most important thing? What's the most important thing affecting my weight? Well, there are many things. And this does include obviously nutrition, fast food, soda, uh, but also things like urban planning. Here in Rhode Island, we drive everywhere. We're not in a walking city. In fact, I have patients from Boston or New York, and they will say to me, I gained weight when I moved to Rhode Island. So everything in our environment over the years has shifted, making us uh, move less and eat more. So here we are again, back at my uh, favorite set point range. Um, before I go to my next point, let's just take a look at that weight set point range. And if I were to say to you that a person woke up, they had cereal for breakfast in the morning, they had an apple at break, at lunchtime they had a cheeseburger, in the afternoon they had a yogurt, and then in the evening they have mac and cheese and finish up with a small bowl of ice cream. Who do you think that person is as you look at that set point range? It's really hard to tell. I hope that you can see that you could be anyone. You could be the naturally thin Nikki who has a very uh, low body weight or someone who's at the higher end of the weight set point range. So what tends to happen is that if you are carrying extra uh, body fat, you tend to be judged by society. People think that your lifestyle is the main reason you are the size and shape that you are. But it's just not true. You cannot judge someone's lifestyle based on their size. So what I'd like to talk about next, you may have been looking at that set point range and think, I used to be 
at a lower body weight. I feel like my set point has changed. It's higher now. I used to be able to get back to a lower weight, but I can't do that anymore. Why is that? Well, one of the things that we know happens in obesity is you can develop leptin resistance. Now, leptin is a hormone that's produced by our external body fat. That's the only place it's produced. And it's a very important hormone that goes up and tells the brain how much body fat we have on board. So if you gain weight, you produce more leptin. The brain receives that message and says, okay, you've put on some more weight. What I'm going to do, I'm going to increase your metabolism. I'm going to make you less hungry and more full. Leptin is like our fat thermostat trying to keep our weight in balance. However, unfortunately, we know that if you gain a certain amount of weight, and it seems to be different for everyone, you can develop leptin resistance. So you're producing the leptin just as you should. It's going up to the brain, but the brain is not receiving the message. This is something that we cannot measure, unfortunately, in a lab test. So we're sort of left knowing that this exists, it's a problem, but we cannot quantify it. So what do we do here at the Healthier Weight Program? We are trying to help patients find the low end of their set point range. We don't know what it is, but what we do know is all the factors that play into where you are on your set point range. So we address all of those things so that they are at optimal, sustainable levels for you. So one of the things that we know really can affect your weight is sleep. Sleep deprivation causes weight gain. You can see here on this slide that sleep deprivation can directly lower your leptin level, that helpful hormone that increases our metabolism. Leptin is actually produced at night. So if you shortchange yourself on sleep, you're shortchanging yourself on that helpful hormone leptin. Sleep deprivation also increases our insulin and cortisol levels. Both these hormones lead to putting down more body fat and they prefer that fat to be put down in our middle, which seems to increase our cardiovascular risk. The other common sense thing uh, that happens when we don't get enough sleep is that it leads to a bad day the next day. We tend to be tired. We're less likely to go grocery shopping for making a nutritious meal. We're less likely to go to the gym. In fact, it really is all about survival that day. Get me through the day so that I can get back uh, to bed again and get some sleep. So we're not really leading our optimal lifestyle when we're sleep deprived. What is optimal sleep? We know from studies that if you are getting five or less hours of sleep at night, you are more likely to have a weight issue. If you're getting seven to eight hours sleep, your sleep is not affecting your weight. So six hours are sort of in the middle there. So I ask everyone to aim for seven or eight hours sleep if possible. Take a look at this slide. I hope none of you do night shift work. Uh, if you do, you can look at this slide and see what risk for diabetes that it can have. This is from the American Diabetes Association Journal, February 2018, and it showed that if you're doing frequent night shifts, you have a 44% increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Stress is pretty similar to sleep deprivation. You'll see we've got the same hormones mentioned, increased cortisol, insulin. There's not much we can do to take stress out of our life, but what we can do is learn strategies for coping with it better so that our stress isn't getting the better of us. And that means we're less likely to have these metabolic consequences of high cortisol levels leading to more weight gain. What about exercise? So we all know that exercise is extremely good for us. Uh, but many of you may have noticed that you have, through 
having a desk job that you may have put on weight. And as soon as you start to exercise and try and reverse the weight gain, that nothing happens. You go all out on a walking program or join a gym. After four to six weeks, you step on the scale. And what do you see? Very little change. So this is typical. Exercise is excellent for keeping you at the low end of your set point range. It's excellent for preventing weight gain, but exercise will not cause you to shed a lot of your excess body weight. Once again, this is an example of the body wanting to hold on to your fat and not let it go. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be exercising. Exercise, gaining fitness, does mean less diabetes, less weight gain, and less cardiovascular disease. In fact, when you look at any medical condition and you divide uh, patients with these conditions into those who exercise and those that do not, the exercise group, no matter what they are suffering, they do better. The body will let you lose weight through exercise in one exception. If you are very fit, the body will let you lose weight. Of course, genetically, it does want you to be able to escape the lion that's chasing you across the African plains, right? So if you are fit, there is a special metabolism that leads to fat burning. But unfortunately, you can only get that advantage if you become fit. The good news is, no matter what your weight, you can achieve the same fitness as someone who is normal weight. You are not at any exercise disadvantage so long as you're able to do it. So let's finally take a look at nutrition. So think big. All of those fad studies that you may see in magazines or in the newspapers really aren't of any value. What really is interesting in terms of nutrition is looking at the big studies. So I'm going to share three studies with you that really gave us good information. They were good studies. We've got the PREDIMED study, 7,400 people, done over a period of five years. This was the Mediterranean diet olive oil, fresh fruits and vegetables, and very little meat. Next, we have the PURE study. This was 135,000 people, studied over seven years, and this showed that high fat lowered mortality. What was that about? Well, you may all remember in the 1980s, the American Cardiology Association decided to put the whole country on a low-fat diet. And this really backfired because the food industry to compensate for the low-fat diet, started adding sugar to all of our foods. So we were on a low-fat, high-sugar diet, and this did not improve our health. So this study was showing that if we are eating the right fat, such as olive oil, avocado, nuts, and less of the dairy fat, we actually had better cardiovascular health. In fact, we were able to live longer. And finally, we've got the fruit and be vegetable study. So this also was a large study showing what you really already know. Fruits and vegetables are good for us and they decrease cardiovascular events, cancer, and increases how long we live. Let's now take a look at nutrition that worsens health. We have the Harvard study. It was 126,000 people studied over 32 years. It took 32 years for us to ban trans fat from commercially available products. Now they are banned because trans fats strongly increase mortality. Also, we know that saturated fats mildly increase mortality. Saturate fats are found in meats and dairy, butter, cheese, whole milk, and other animal products. And finally, we see here the NHANES study. This is what generated all the palaver about soda. This study involved 320,000 people. It was a study that lasted 15 years, and it showed that if you had more than seven sodas a week, you actually did not live as long. This translated into generally an added sugar intake of 350 calories a day, and this translated into an increased mortality.
So let me tell you about our approach here. We teach all patients intuitive eating. Intuitive eating uh, was written by Evelyn Triboli and Elise Resch, two rock star nutritionists out in California, and they packaged intuitive eating into a 10 principle program that we follow here. We offer it in individual classes with one on one instruction from our nutritionists or in group settings. Intuitive eating has four main principles mindfulness coping with emotions without using food, learning to exercise because it feels good and not associating it with our weight, and having a gentle approach to nutrition where we are satisfied and are enjoying what we eat. So why do we take this approach? Well, if we take a look at Carolina Povian's 13 Real Reasons You Aren't Losing Weight. She was the president of the Obesity Society and published this in Reader's Digest, January 2019. When you look at this list, you will see no mention of calories, no mention of portion control, no mention of specific foods, protein, carbs, or fat. What you see is a list of reasons that overlap with intuitive eating. Let's look at a few of them. You eat while you're distracted. You're a slave to healthy brands. You have a list of forbidden foods. You feel bad about your weight. You've set the wrong goal. What is the wrong goal? The wrong goal is setting a weight goal. Your goal needs to be all about improving your behaviors. You see that it mentions stress and sleep. So really, losing weight is about learning to become an intuitive eater, an established regular exerciser who gets plenty of sleep, copes with stress, and takes pleasure in food. So that brings me to the end of my talk. I hope you found it interesting. The next step is for us to meet one-on-one so that I can hear your story and we can come up with a plan for you. Until then, I'm Dr. Bodkin. Have a wonderful week.